Kia ora, welcome to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod on RugbyPass.com and Sky Sport. And what a weekend of rugby it was again. Super Rugby has just got super interesting. James Parsons here in the Auckland studio, Bryn Hall down in Christchurch. And before we get on to, you know, drop goals and things like that, Bryn, we've got to talk about this shirt. <laughs> His A game, since coming off the playing paddock and becoming a businessman. <laughs> Look at this. Do we have to up our game? Mate, I'm just trying to lift the standards of my old mate down there. Just, you know, just well, constantly. Mate, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna black AS color t-shirt and I've seen Chipper obviously wearing the blue shirt and then on the weekend as well, that Highlanders game. Jeez, was that a three-piece suit there, Chipper? <laughs> Mate, I was just trying, to, you know, lift my standing, just trying to lift my standards to marshal standards. But as sharp as you are, you're not looking as sharp as the Chiefs right now. No, I'm not. I'm not. They are, they are on some sort of roll. And uh, I, I honestly think the biggest part of their turnaround um, is their set piece. The, the last time they played the Crusaders, they ran their, their line out at 40% and scrum at 50%. On the weekend, 100% line out and 100% scrum. And then obviously since their four game winning streak, they were 100% line out against the Canes, 83% against the Blues and 70% against the Landers. And their scrum was 100% in all those games, including a tight hit against the Blues. And the Blues were obviously the form scrum. And I, I think that platform, and we already knew about their breakdown ability and the fact that they could you know, recycle ball at a tempo and at stages on the weekend the tempo got the better of them I think they ran a little cut play and, and an inside ball to a blind runner and they, he ran into Brad Weber and even Brad Weber was blowing at one stage you know because the tempo was that fast and they had so much territory and possession that it took its toll um, but they are on form the one thing I have got to credit the Crusaders is one you don't have to give them much for them to take an opportunity. Mm. So that, that, to their own standards, and Bryn will elaborate on it, they're not playing anywhere near their best, and they're still in the position to win these games. Won it last week when they didn't play at their best. So you've got to credit, you know, you've got to admire it. I admire it to still not be playing at their best and still be in a position to win it. And Brad Weber's comments at the end, to be the best, you must beat the best. And they left a lot of their best cattle at home. So we're still not there yet. One, that's awesome that Brad Weber knows that they're not there yet and they still want to head on that trajectory. But, you know, there also sends a message that the Crusaders aren't at the best yet and, you know, the teams are still chasing them and they're still to the top dog. Yeah, those are all pretty valid points from Jip. And I think the summary of my game that I probably had there, this is probably going into your domain here, Jip, with a few stats. And probably the losing of the game for us is probably that third quarter just after half time, the 40 to 60 minute mark. Yes, that's so we had. Uh, we attempted 131 tackles in that 21 minutes, whereas the Chiefs attempt, uh, attempted seven. Yeah. You know, so that's some pretty um, some pretty interesting stats. And, you know, you talk around that tempo jip and their breakdown, you know, they, were, they were pretty brutal around that. They scored 14 points in that in that 20-minute zone and um, really brought that momentum back into the game. So um, a good comment that, you know, Brad Weber actually talked about at, in the post-match was around uh, holding on to the ball. And for most of their tries that they did score, they were at that kind of 10, 11 phases where we um, let tries in and penalties early on in the game. So, yeah, did really well. And again, when you're making, you know, we, t we attempted 250 tackles in a game um, to still be in a position to to win the game. Yeah, it's great for us. But again, we can't afford to be tackling, you know, attempting 250 tackles. So we're 80 to the Chiefs, you know, they're getting too much ball and, and stunts our attack. And, you know, we're probably a little bit sloppy attack due to that many tackles in a game. So um, you're just going to, Make sure we've got our review tomorrow, and you know we've just got to make some pretty, um, some pretty, probably do our changes around our breakdown. I think um, again we're still struggling, struggling in that breakdown area where the Chiefs are really dominant in that um, their collision contact and even you know even to the discipline point, I, I was quite surprised that the the convincing lead you had at half time, Bryn. Did you feel that as well? Like I think the penalty count at one stage was six one at half time, you know, in favour of the Chiefs. And they tried to build that scoreboard pressure and then, you know, there was a bit of a flurry of tries, uh, uh, well, a try that, that got that lead um, into the break. And that, that's what I mean. Like, you don't have to give the Crusaders much for them to make you, you know, make you pay. And, and it's, um, you know, it's, you know, I know that it, they're irritated that they're losing, but it, it, it's, it's, it's a compliment, but it's not a compliment. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it just shows that, 
they've they've still got plenty of in them. It's just they're not stringing their usual phases together, and it, and it's taking the toll. The amount of defending they're having to do, especially against teams like the Chiefs, because they do hold on to the ball and they recycle it quickly through that lightning quick ball, and it's relentless. And the and the biggest thing is is I think you know they had 39 defenders beaten. You know that's hard when you're. When you're beating that many defenders, that means you're going to you're getting in behind the defensive line. Mm. So you're always chasing your tail to get in behind, and it, it's it's just it's too big a too big a task at times to to shut down. Whereas you know the, the Crusaders had 13 defenders beaten, so they're not having that same Bryn mentioned around that you know that breakdown. That not having the same front foot ball to get that lightning quick ball. It's a lot easier to clean rucks when you're getting in behind that defensive line to get the lightning quick, quick ball. If you're not getting in behind, it's, you know, you're having to move a little bit more set bodies, which is harder. Bryn, this seems to have been happening over a few weeks now. Is there a touch of frustration in around the camp and not being able to fix the things that you know what you need to fix? It's just not happening yet. There is frustration because, again, you want to be winning games and you want to be playing um, to the way that you want to play. And so... I think teams are, are holding on to the ball a little bit more um, in that period of, um, period of play. I talked about 40 minutes in that 40 to 60 minute zone. The ball was in play for nine minutes for the Chiefs and we only had it for two minutes. So, you know, teams are holding on to the ball against us, which is good. And I thought um, they adapted really well with that set piece as well. They went over the top of the line out quite a lot. I, I think the times just after half time was, was a pretty good as well. I think Damian McKenzie, his kicking game was, was pretty, was really good. I um, mean, some good variety around his long kicks, even early on in the game. The first, I think it was the first scrum attack. He ended up kicking it to, into our, um, our zone, finding some grass and then applying pressure that way. And then in the second half, he changed a little bit around doing contestables off 10. And then they got a good pay around that where our boys didn't catch the ball on the full. And then the times that they did have that ball, they scored tries off that. For us, it's been able to um, get a few things right, like the, the points that I've brought up. And... Again, we've just got to be honest around that. We'll have a, a good honesty in our review, and then uh, we've just got to make those changes. Again, we know what they are. Some of them we do know what they are. Again, it just comes down to execution, so we've just got to make sure we just get a little bit better in those departments. I suppose the thing is that there was a chance there to win the game, but you guys would be looking at this the same either way, wouldn't you? Whether you'd won or lost, those issues remain the same, depending on a, a drop goal winning the match. Yeah, absolutely. We had, you know, considering that, you know, we made that many tackles, um, we still had a, we were still in a position even before that, before Damas penalty, we were in a position where we were, where we were in the lead and then um, just do a bit of discipline again, which cost us that penalty for Damo um, with three minutes to go. And then we still had our chance to really well, a very similar scenario we had against the um, the Hurricanes going into looking for a drop goal. So um, I didn't want to be in those positions, but in these derbies, you know, these teams, especially the Chiefs, like we talked about last week, they're fighters and you know they, they go to the 80th minute and that's what they did on the weekend. So if we find ourselves where we've got to go into a drop goal, um, you know, again, we've got to be better at that breakdown, which was probably the losing of the game, not getting that um, that breakdown and that last breakdown penalty by Arcoy. Yeah, and one of the things I noticed in the lead-up to that, there were probably maybe two breakdowns where Richie was in position in the pocket, but the ball came to you so slowly. Was that the reason why you couldn't get the ball back to him? We're gonna, it's funny, hindsight's a great thing, and we were getting ready to kick um, pretty much straight after that penalty. But again, that's the, the, the risk that you have. Um, the week before, you know, we probably went a little bit earlier, and then that one there, uh, we left it a, a phase too late, and then, you know, Akui makes a great play around getting a turnover. So, again, you've just got to be a little bit better, a little bit more ruthless, and the week before we were, and then, unfortunately, on the weekend, it's rugby, and, um, you know, Akui made play, and we weren't able to give it back to Richard. He was in the pocket, probably getting ready off that ruck. So what were the comms coming to you from Richie? Oh, similar to last week, we're getting ready to, to do the drop goal. So, so um, it seems but, like, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not ready yet, I'm not ready yet. And you're like, OK, I'll get another another ruck, another ruck. It was just a feel like that before that before that ruck. Um, they did a good counter counter ruck at that ruck. And so the ball's a little bit slow. And so the defensive line probably a little bit more than set and probably knew that Richie was in the, in the back. Um, and so we wanted to go another ruck to try and set it up a little bit better. Um, and if we would have got that ball out, it's a better kicking, on, kicking angle as well. But, yeah, again, a fair play to our core. He made a great play and, um, and won them the game in that moment. Sorry to harp on about this. When you say kicking angle, would he prefer a ruck to his right-hand side because the ball's going to come to him here as opposed to left-hand side where the ball's coming from there and it might take him longer to get around to kick the ball? Is that what you mean? Yeah, ideally, that's the, that's the positioning. But, again, it's depending on how the, how, how the ball is going. Um, the defence line isn't set, um, then all those kind of um, variations come into the decision-making around that. So, um, again, if we find ourselves in that position, we just need to be a little bit better and, um, and so we can get, this, get the chance to have, have a drop-go in that scenario. 
Yeah, we, can, we can let that go now? <laughs> well, I think we can let it go. We can also <laughs> congratulate Akoi. I think a pretty bold play. You know, like sometimes it's you, you consider, do we just D it out and just not give away the penalty? Mm. And, you know, he just backed his instinct there to get on the ball. And, you know, when um, Scott Barrett went for the challenge, I was like, oh, you know, has he done something wrong here? Because it was it was obviously going to be on under the microscope. But he was perfect in terms of attacking the ball. Nowhere was he off his feet or on his knee or his hands went and touched the grass. And that's a big play by, you know, a, still a pretty inexperienced player. Um, and, and he just nailed it. And it was, you know, massive congrats to him for, you know, just backing his instinct, mm. not worrying about the moment or what point, because it could have easily have gone wrong and he gives the penalty away and they lose. But he wasn't worried about that. He just played rugby and played what's in front of him. And I think that's a massive pat on the back for him to just play rugby in that moment, because so, so often you can think about the situation, the circumstance, and let that sort of maybe scare you out of just playing based on your instinct. And he didn't let that happen, and, and he nailed it, and, and what a result for his team. I suppose the hard part about a ruck is you've got the discipline aspect of it, don't you? So if you're the, the defending team, you can either see it as a chance to end their drop goal chance by going in on the ball, or a chance to give away a silly penalty and give them the shot at goal. So yeah. th it is, it's a difficult situation to go in and do something like that. Absolutely, and I think it was actually a great tackle by Nate Harris, who it was great to see him back after such a long break. Um, he's worked his way back from injury, so it was, you know, congrats to him seeing him back. But he did a really good chop tackle, got low, um, got the uh, carrier to the ground and got out of there. So it gave him all rights and access. As you saw, a lot of penalties that night, um, they were penalised because the tackler didn't get out of there. So every time they went, the, the actual jackler was fine, but because the tackler didn't roll out of the ruck, he was the one getting penalised mm. rather than the jackler. But Nate Harris made the tackle, chopped into the ground and got out of there straight away. And then Arcoy was on the ball. So everyone played their role perfectly in that moment. Had they not, and had he got trapped in there, doesn't matter what Arcoy had done, it would have been the penalty would have been based on the tackler's role. So it was just a perfect scenario. And from what had already happened, they'd learnt from you know what they'd already been penalised earlier in the night, which was perfect. Arkoy's having a hell of a season, isn't he? Like, he he is. And, and as I mentioned about the line-out shifts, you know, between him and Tupo Vai, you know, like it's been it's been massive. So massive the shift in the growth in them as line-out leaders. It's such a harder job than you know Sam Whitelock and and Scott Barrett and Co. Make it look you know, easy, but it's not. It's, it's such a hard job calling a line out and manipulating defence and getting that ball won. Um, and they're getting creative, they're really thinking. Actually, Neil Barnes needs a, a, a pat on the back as well as a coach. So does Nick White um, and the shifts they've made in their scrums, uh, you know, because it's a collaboration and, and, and that is a big cornerstone to their success in, in their turnaround. Mm. Brim, what do you see out of them? Obviously, we saw them under Warren Gatlin last year struggle. This year, under Clayton McMillan, it took them a while, but they seem to have found their feet. What do you see as the major shift from 2020 and an abysmal season to 2021? And they look like they're coming strong at a final position. Well, I, th I think it was always it was always going to happen. I think we talked about it earlier in the early in the podcast, early in the year. Around, we thought. You know they were doing some really good things, even though they hadn't get the, got the, gotten the results. You know they were playing some really good footy, and it only took one game. Re well, it took one game for them to get their to get their mojo back. So um, they're adapting. They're adapting. So I think last year with Warren Gatlin, they were just I guess in that kind of middle stage of having a new coach and uh, maybe not having an having an identity and trying to figure out what Chiefs rugby looks like um, with obviously a new coach. But they just fit, they seem like they've got their tactics right this year. Um, you know, they've, they've won four games in a row. Um, their style of play that they're playing, like I said to you, their kicking options from Damo has been um, has, has been great. The different types of the kicks that have been putting teams under pressure. Um, they've had different phase play shapes, which have been successful against them in previous weeks. So I think they're just marrying up really well. And um, again, I said we said earlier in the podcast, they're a proud team and it wasn't going to be long. All they needed was a bit of luck, which we talked about. Hey, what are you seeing in their shapes? Look, I think they would have had a, a, a fairly... Um, robust discussion around their plan together. I don't think it's Warren Gatlin and Clayton McMillan last year and then it's all different this year. I still think they're a team and, and they would have come up with a plan together and that's still, um, you know, they're a united force. I don't see it as a separate 
two separate entities. I still think they're together and that will continue on next year once they're back. So I don't see it as so much as what's different between the two um, um, sort of setups. Uh, what I would say is, um, you know, speaking to Sam Kane, is he said, you know, like he felt like last year, you know, they were that close on so many of these results, you know, that it was there wasn't a lot in it. Whereas, you know, this year, um, you know, the tides turned on a few 50-50 calls that sort of changed their luck a little bit. Um, and and they've, you know, grown confidence once that luck turned in that Hurricanes game, the belief starts and that's how it, how it's sort of changed. So it, I don't think there's a hell of a lot structurally um, but it, there's so much of it is mental and that belief and that, that energy that comes from it and they've just stuck to their guns a little bit but I, I, still, I still believe that they've, that first game of the year even when they lost the quick, yeah. um, the quick 22s, the quick tap nature, the clean outs um, the brutal force game that we saw and we sat here and said and I said look I don't want to compare them to 212, 213 but there was there was reflections of that mm. for me and then now that they're getting their set piece sorted there's very much that flavour to it and I think we saw that again the other night um, and yep Brad Webber said they'd like to win it by more and not leave it to the last minute but they're winning games they know how to win games because they're fighters and, and that's what they've mm. built themselves around. So um, I, don't, I, I, I don't know if that really answers it that well because I just don't think there is a separation between the two. Yeah. Um, but I think you know, once that luck turned for them and they've got a few of their core big rocks sorted, they've started to believe in themselves a little bit more. It is an interesting um, scenario though. I think it's probably an unprecedented scenario where let's say, and <laughs> they went to the title and they won the whole thing. Mm. And suddenly you've got the coach who won the title but having to move back to a system. How do we, a weird situation. How do, we, how do we not know that they're not connecting? Yeah, yeah. We don't know. We're not in their environment. How do we not know that Warren's not involved? Well, yeah. We, we don't know. We're not, we're not in there. So he could be playing a big role. Yeah. We, we, we've just got no clue. He might not be playing any role. He could be having Zoom meetings with players, leadership groups. He could be, he could be doing all sorts that we don't know. Yeah. Um, we'd only know if they told us, but there's no way they're going to tell us. So, <laughs> um, yeah. it's, it's only it's it's only we're, we're guessing, um, and I don't think it's a problem they mind us discussing because we're discussing it because they're going so well. Yeah, hundred percent. They're they're winning. But I, I think Clayton does need to have a big pat on the back because under pressure of those first two games, everyone was like, "Oh, this is a um, he's been thrown a dud. He's been thrown a hospital pass." And at no, uh, at no one point did he blink. He, he, he just stayed calm, you know? And, and he's, even when they've started going well, yeah, he showed some emotion when they've won a, a close game and they've, you know, as you should. But he still stays calm and he's on to the next job the next week. And, and, and I think that's, that's why they want to play for him and, and you know, there's a good solid foundation there between leaders and coaches. And, and that's why I mentioned Neil Barnes as well. You know, that, that he's obviously got those forwards humming with Nick White. Um, and, and I think it's a timely, um, you know, uh, I suppose comeback for Lockie Boucher. I thought he was exceptional yeah. on the weekend. Uh, with, with Sammy being out, uh, for him to come back and perform the way he did for 69 minutes uh, with a bit of club rugby under his belt. Um, you know, with the injuries that we've got at seven, he has to, you know, after missing out on all black selection, I know I digress here, but <laughs> <laughs> this is what I do. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like, you know, he misses out and, he, you know, everyone talks about him being a little bit unlucky. Well, you know, he puts in a performance like that, a couple more of those, and, you know, if they can get to the final, uh, he has to be right up in the. Uh, you know, the chat for, for an all-back opportunity yeah, as well. He, he's phenomenal. And, you know, that whole loose forward trio from the Chiefs is phenomenal and have been for a couple of years, really. Even when they've been going backwards, they're yeah. throwing Ab themselves in there. Absolutely, and they're a big part of that lightning quick ball we talk of. But on the actual flip side, a man that played seven in the opposition, who's not a usual seven, was exceptional the other night. Um, Bryn, you, must have been, you guys must have been wrapped. You know, you're obviously looking for putting a big body in there. And he, he, he definitely got around the field, but also made his presence felt on, on the night. 
This is Tom Sanders I'm obviously talking about. Yeah, he did, mate. Colonel Wheel, he was, he was exceptional. And I think for a guy that um, had such a great season last year and was rewarded with obviously being in the um, South team, um, and then to be unfortunately had a pretty bad injury early on in the season to not be able to regain that form and to be able to play footy. Um, yeah, he's come back roaring. So he did his due diligence around his recovery and was <laughs> – was a, was a hundy at training around, you know, he's one of the guys at trainings that, um, you know, always puts you on edge. So um, he brings that into the game and look, yeah, it's a set, it's a position that he hasn't played a lot, but again, has on the weekend, around, he had a great couple of good steals especially in big, in big moments and then um, his work rate off the ball as well around, we talk around uh, breakdowns, he was great in our breakdown and being able to get us quick ball being that bigger body. So um, yeah, he, he had a great, he had a great game and um, you know, fingers crossed he can stay injury free because again he's been great for us at the time. Probably in the last 12, 12 months when he's been injury free, he's had some really good performances for us. So, um, really proud of Colonel. He's obviously had a, had a tough run um, a little bit. So, uh, it's good great to see him on on the field on the weekend. He, he's another one that has to be on the radar as well because of that performance in the North versus South game. You know, like he was put in that environment and he had a big game that night. And then now, after a bit of another injury, he's come back and performed in an, an out of position. You know, like that's a big statement in itself as well. I think it is. I think the fact that you know he, he can, you know, he can play six. He's played eight for us as well. And then being able to have that seven um, opportunity to play seven and to be able to play all three of those forward trees. We talk around squad members and being able to pick on versatility. Um, if he continues to get, if you know, if he has an opportunity to play seven again, and that's performances like that. Then again, his conversation has to be in the reckoning. Um, but being able to be so versatile, playing six, seven, and eight, like we talked about earlier with um, versatile Egypt. There's a number of those guys around, aren't there? Now you've obviously got Dalton to play right around the place. Um, Boshier could play both sides of the scrum. Yep. Jacobson can play six, seven, eight. There's a lot of adaptability in and around the loose forward stocks in good form. Absolutely, there is, and and there's you know you even look at the way maybe not the ability of versatility, but the performance of Harmon of late. You know, he's, he's playing some great footy and he was exceptional on Friday night. You know, he, he really won the breakdown battle, uh, uh, um, you know, in that Blues-Highlanders game. So there's, there's talent aplenty. Um, and then you look at that six battle between, you know, Akira and, and Shannon, which was just, just beast versus beast. Um, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was huge. How do you see Akira going at the moment? I suppose last year there was a lot of fanfare. Is he keeping up to the same standard that he had last year? I think so. Like he started really well, and then obviously with big minutes, um, you know, Tom commentaries like we need to rotate. We we learned from a few years ago if you just throw him out there 80 minutes and, and drive him into the ground, that's no good for anyway, mm. anyone. So that rotation with Tom Robinson, and unfortunately, obviously, Tom got knocked out early and Akira went out um, early. But I, I, I still think he's playing extremely well and, and doing a great job. Um, and, and the stats stack up with that. Um, so I, I still think he's right in the mix. As we've said, um, in past weeks, I think that six jersey and the style of play the All Blacks like, it's between Shannon and Akira um, for, for that mix. And, and the other night, um, it was two different styles on show, and both of them um, you know, held their own. Uh, but you know, Shannon really showed that brute force, especially defensively. You're going to have to be Superman to get Shannon Frizzell out of that six jersey after last week and the weeks before that. Yeah, like... but I, I, think, I think you've got to look at... Um, you know, last year's performance in the all-black environment, they do take that into account. But the current form, I mean, Shannon Frizzell is playing out of his skin. Like, it's, it's just yeah. unbelievable. I mean, he is... The, that, that rush tackle on Harry Plummer and then up to his feet, barge through, get a crucial turnover, I mean, that, that is a hell of a play. I mean, and that was, that was second half... He's already done a big shift. I think it was around 50 minutes. You know, it's a big, it's a big play. It's a hungry man wanting to win a game in front of his home crowd. And they, you know, speaking to Mitch Hunt after the game, they really wanted to win in front of their home crowd. They're disappointed with their performances um, under the roof. And you know, then Billy Harmon said the two areas they really wanted to sharpen up on was their tempo of play, which I think we saw, and then you know their physicality at the breakdown. And, and you know, he was a big part of that. Bryn, we saw another outstanding set play with Aaron Smith coming out and then popping the inside ball. Geez, another Tony Brown, you know, benchmark, stamp of approval. Yeah, it is, and it comes back to preparation around what they obviously saw. Um, you know, 
Jonathan Ruru and then that's defended at the back of the team. Um, Ufo was the last guy at the back of that line out and um, whether he got caught in that um, and stayed in there or, or they had previously in, on the other side they had three guys um, holding again they see an animation down that way and then Aaron Smith comes around and, and puts a great ball for Fernani Ponovai so Variety is probably the best thing around is around that. The week before they went down the short side, Blues probably would have seen that, and then they've gone the open side um, from that. So uh, when you talk around special plays, you've got to have a bit of variety. And so, you know, when you're playing teams, if you go open, if you go down the blind side, you've got to be on it the whole time. So um, yeah, fair play. That was it was another try, another great try, and um, you know, adds to the the Tony Brown legend of being able to have great moves. I think this is where they're at their best though. I think earlier in the season they were fixated on that driving mall and they thrashed it, thrashed it, thrashed it, thrashed it. And the last two weeks we've mentioned how the innovation that they've had is, has been great. And I think that's where one, you know, Tony Brown's at his best, but also the Highlanders love it. Like they feed off it, they get energy off those, you know, those moves and, um, you know, I think the Blues really miss Tom Robinson going off early because that's a big part of his game as he would have probably ID'd Punivai out the back there and would have been able to help his teammates around there that they didn't get caught up in that mall and they probably could have seen him. But, you know, they didn't and then it created that space and they scored the try from it. But it was executed perfectly and, and at a crucial time and, and a big momentum shifter after the Blues had got themselves right back into the game. Um, and then for them to score on the break like that was was a was a killer blow, and and made to look it was you know they did it quite easily um, when you know it, it shouldn't have been mm-hmm. you know in, in that at that time at that crucial period, um, and that's why you know Tom uh, leaving the field so early was was quite a crucial blow for that night. Bryn touched on it before and what D-Mac brought um, with his kicking game. How did you see the way that he, him playing at 10 evolved? I know you've been a fan of him playing at 10 late in the game, mm. but starting the game, were you impressed? I liked it. Yeah, I, I really liked it, the way he approached it. I thought he was really calm in his approach. He, he, was, um, you know, he was really that general distributor early and just injected himself you know, when he needed to and when the opportunity presented itself. I thought Alex Nankivel was awesome outside of him. I thought he had one of his best games. I thought ALB was great again. But I, you know, I thought uh, Nankivel, for someone who hasn't played a lot of rugby because um, Quinto Pai has been there, um, I thought he had a massive game which took the pressure off. Um, and you know, I think the ability of Chase Tiatia from the back um, also meant that you know, Damien could just focus on controlling the team which he did really well, and the forwards just rolled their sleeves up and, and allowed them to do that. And they were they were pretty clear in their plan, I think, of how they. And you have to be pretty strict and clear in your plan to beat the Crusaders. And you've got to be, uh, as the Highlanders showed, you have to be pretty strict and resilient in it for 80 minutes to get the job done. Um, and the Chiefs showed that again. That it, it's a, you've got to be strict and resilient in it for 80 minutes to get the job done. Mm-hmm. Um, because they're a tough side to beat and they will not go away. And as I've pointed out, you do not need to give them much for them to hurt you. Um, so that's why I think you know, he, was, he was really um, strong in his performance at 10 and I think he would be really proud of it. And the biggest thing is, is his pressure kicking. Uh, his his sideline kick, Jonah Lowe, was so crucial mm. to get that one point up, um, you know, and then, you know, I suppose Richie's miss on Cody's one, you know, those are the, you know, moments where probably it's, you're used to it being the other way around. Um, you know, so it's, he, he just had a great night. He had probably his best game of the season, I'd say, in terms of the way he led his team around the park and, and, his, and his, um, his goal kicking and the way he put his team in the best place to win. So does he stay there, Bryn? Or does he go back to 15? No, I, I, well, I think you've got to, you got to keep him there. I think you know. Again, even though he didn't he didn't run there much, um, he more had that kind of game management, great kicking, and great. He was a great distributor. I think again, when once he does get that running game going, um, it's just going to add more to it. So, you, know, you talk around. We talked around previously around his game management, and um, at ten, it's a bit been at fifteen, even though it's obviously similar in this day and age. But um, his game management was fantastic on the weekend. So um, he's only going to grow if he gets more time in there, and then. You know, once he does open up and he starts running, then again, you put those two things he did really well on the weekend with his game management, his kicking, and his overall goal kicking. You had that running game as well. That's a real, that's a triple threat. So he's only going to get better with game and time. And um, what a great time for the Chiefs, especially at the back end of the year where, um, you know, finals footy is just around the corner. And on the other end of the ledger, we've got Josh Iwane. And he's now playing fullback all the time. 
do you feel, Jipper, that that's the place that he needs to be, considering how well he's playing there? Oh, I, I think it's it's like for like 10 and 15, the way the Highlanders play. I think they've switched Mitch Hunt and Josh up in other games. I think, you know, I, th I can't remember what game it was. I think it might have been the Blues or something. I can't mm. remember. So I, I don't think it's a big thing. Josh is at fullback or he's at first five. Um, so I don't think it's a set thing for him to be in his position. I think he's playing good footy. He's injected himself really well off the bench the week before. He played well um, the other night. He looks comfortable there. He's another player when he's got time and ability to see and, and present himself on the game. Um, you know, he looks silky. Um, he glides. Uh, he's got a good kicking game. Um, so, look, he's, he's, he just looks like a man that's focused on, on playing well. And, um, you know, he's just continuing on that form. He looks like a man who could play test football to me. But when you look at the way it works out, if we're talking, looking at 10s, we've got Richie, obviously Bowden's coming back, we've got Damien McKenzie playing well. At fullback, we've got, you know, again, Bowden and Damien McKenzie, plus you've got Will Jordan, you've got um, Geordie Barrett, you've got all of these people. Does he even fit into the squad? It'll be depending on the makeup of what they want to go mm. go with, like how many first five fullback options they, they carry. Um, do they see Damien as a genuine first five? If so, then maybe not, I don't know. Um, so I, I don't have the answer for that. Um, but he's definitely playing well enough to warrant selection. Yeah. Absolutely he is, but so do all the other guys. I mean, one name that we haven't mentioned from the other night that deserves it, especially after his first half, is Will Jordan. I mean, he was just silky. He, he was seriously good. Um, so there's plenty of talent out there. Um, but that, and that, that's the beauty of the All Blacks, is there's so much good talent that misses out. Uh, the, the, the thing is, is, all you can control as a player is your, por your performance. That's the only currency you've got. If you look after that, you put yourself in the best position to be selected. Mm. Bryn, you're a current player. Do you, do you have these kind of conversations at home with your flatmates going through the lists of who could be where and how and, and how they could fit into an all-black lineup, or do you guys just drop rugby when you get home? Oh, you've, you have conversations here and there, especially with when you when you do watch games. You know, you go on tour and um, you end up watching the games and you start commenting on how, how good players are playing, and you do talk about it just loosely. Um, you know, we probably don't go into in-depth around, you know, around in the squad who we think it is because, again, just kind of fix that on your own thing, but... Um, you definitely do talk about it and you talk around the performance around players and how they are playing and um, especially in that fullback position there's so much good talent at the moment and you know I thought Will was, was, was great on the weekend especially in that first half we looked back to his old self around uh, really injecting himself and um, you know he, you've got no substitute for speed with Will and you get him in the open field um, he's going to get away like he did on the weekend so um, but I think another first one I, I just I, I like seeing Mitch Hunt at 10 I love seeing him at 10 and um, you talk around some courageous efforts. I think he did a he did a great cover tackle on Caleb Clark, um, in that in that hot in that Hollanders game, uh, Hollanders Blues three. game, and so he's, he's a guy. Look, like, yeah, he's a guy that's just you know he's playing well as well. So, and I like I like having I like seeing Hunty and Joshuani at the back. Joshuani's great on the on the counter attack. His his um counter attack play, and you know I thought he was actually in that in that last try with with Michael Collins. His animation out the back for Michael Collins to get through that line um, was due to Nariki and Ioane's ability to be animated out the back. So um, I, I like that setup they have there at the moment and it just gives Josh a little bit more freedom with his running game, which is so great. It's his biggest strength in that fullback. You've seen it at the forefront with the last couple of full performances that he's had. Can I just say on Mitch Hunt, there was another one, Jared Carley Toyoti went through early in the first half. <laughs> And he stopped him. Yep. And then in that first 20 minutes after half time, um, Jonah Nareki didn't score until the 59th minute. They weathered a storm. Caleb Clark went through yep. a couple of times. The Blues were, they were attacking after attacking after attacking. And Caleb Clark went through a couple of times. And Josh, uh, um, Mitch Hunt and uh, tackled him once. And I think Joshuani stopped him on the other occasion. And those are two massive tackles, you know, by little men against a big man running at full mm. flight that I think were the winning of that game. Because I think if the Blues score there on those two occasions, you, you, that 2017 goes out to, a, you know, a, a deficit. And then they hold on there, mm. they weather that 20 minute storm and then they go down the other end and they, you know, obviously go to their forwards and then they suck in the Blues defenders and score in the corner. And that was a that was a big big moment, and then obviously 
led mm. to the, the red card and then you know the Blues had just got themselves back into it and then the red card came and then that was obviously... Caleb was busy. Mm. 13 carries. Yeah. You know, there was a bit of question about him being quiet, but what, it, what um, I want to say about him being quiet the weeks before is he was creating opportunities for others. So a lot of the time when he's decoy, so I'll use the Highlanders game, I'll reference the Highlanders games last time, and I'll be quick about this because I don't need to talk about all the things, but if you, uh, Imani Nawada's try against the Highlanders the first time they played, the Blues versus Highlanders, is Rico's coming short, Harry Plummer's got the ball, Rico's coming short, out, coming right off his shoulder is Caleb here, and it sucks all the Highlanders' fence, and then Harry Plummer just throws a long ball over to Stevie P, Stevie P draws and pass to Imani. And that's the try. But it's the work of Rico, who's a threat, and Caleb, who's a threat. And it creates the space out here because it sucks in defenders. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, Caleb wasn't getting all the ball and everyone's like, oh, you know, because we're not seeing the highlights and stuff. But Caleb's always running off a halfback shoulder, but then a forward goes through here because Caleb's attract yeah. attention, uh, attention, you know. So sometimes when, you know, we forget as, as viewers... Because we're not seeing them running, everyone's like, oh, he's not playing that well. Well, he's actually doing a hell of a lot of work off the ball to create space for other people. Mm. And, and we just need to you know, acknowledge that. But on the weekend, I think he had had enough of creating space <laughs> for others. Yeah. And he said, give me the ball, I'll create space for myself. And went through people. Yeah, right, left, up the centre, yeah. everywhere. 13 carries, 130-odd metres, line breaks, defenders beaten, um, you know, big defence, big game. Yeah. And he, he made a statement. He looks big when he's carrying the ball. Yeah, like, I thought Rico was big. huge as well. Yeah. You know, Rico was throwing people off when he got the chance in, in that try. A great line he ran on the try. You know, there was some good performance in that Blues team as well. Like, I know they lost and they were expected to win, but there were some players that played extremely well um, for the Blues as well. Let's talk Rico then. And Anton Leonard Brown, who also was very, very busy and exciting and showed some of the outside break stuff that we hadn't seen in a little while, as well as, you know, his usual mistake free stuff that, you know, he does so well. Are these two the two to look at at 13 outside of possibly Nani? Let's talk all black midfield again. You know, we haven't done that enough the last you know weeks. I've been wanting to marry these two up at 12 yeah. and 13 for a while. Yeah. Uh, well, we've, we have talked Nani up, and, and Nani does probably deserve a go at 12. But I would love to see Anton and Rico uh, uh, get, a, uh, get a chance as well. Um, but yeah, they're going for the 13. Because, uh, you know, Nani's form is. is is warranting selection as well. I, I, the, I think all three will get a go mm. at some stage and, and have a spout on the bench as well. Um, what, what it looks like, I'm not too sure because, I mean, they're, they're all playing well. Um, but it, I think Anton's in, in red-hot form. Um, you know, he, he admitted at the start of the season that he wasn't up to his standards, but I'd say, I think if you asked him now, he'd, he'd say, yeah. yeah, I'm good. <laughs> um, and, and Rico's playing well. I yeah. mean, that, that run up the middle, I don't know if you remember it, Bryn, or if you remember it, he was just throwing people off, and I think he offloaded it to Hoss, and it got knocked on, but like, it was unbelievable. <laughs> it was it just, it, it would look like he was back at Auckland Grammar, mm. but he was playing at Super Rugby level. It was, it was incredible. Talked around not Nani around uh, his form, and look, he's been outstanding through the duration of this uh, Super Rugby Aotearoa, but um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they do play 12 and 13, Rico and Rico at 13 and Anton at 12. I don't think, just don't stop thinking about that because I think that could be a combination they could see as well. Yes, Anton's will be playing at centre, uh, but, you know, he has played a lot of 12 with the All Blacks as well. So I do think it is going to be a little bit of a merry-go-round around, around um, Nani, um, Anton and Rico. Around they will get the opportunities and at that next level it's going to be able to see who takes the opportunity when they do get when they do have that chance. And, and you know, don't dismiss David Harvilli who who's been in, in red hot form as well. So his ability to yes, he's played fifteen in the past, but he's had a great season at twelve around um, his decision making and, and his play warrants probably a discussion with the, the other three players that have been named. So um yeah, it's gonna be a uh, guy's gonna be given an opportunity in that black jersey and then it's going to, again, come down to execution and, you know, playing really well. And like Chipper said, you play, the, the better you play, that's your, that's your currency. And it's when you, you get named in teams. Even with injuries, mm. it will still be a tough mm. team to pick. Yeah. And what mm. I like about it is there's a lot of X Factor there at the moment. They're all doing that X Factor yeah. stuff. Yeah. 
There'll be no TJ Pedernata by the looks of it because he might be playing in the NRL sometimes. Yeah, well, I was going to say when Bryn was saying, do, with, do they discuss the All Black squad and stuff, I was like, I guarantee you he'd be like, well, Pedernata had better go to the Roosters. <laughs> he might get his, he might, he might, he might get in the, he, that might get my name in there. Was oh, that a question for me, Jim? Or it... <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think, because um, by the sounds of it, it's just to finish off the season Yeah. after his Japanese contract. So I don't. it doesn't sound like he's doing it to leverage contracts or anything. I think he's genuinely trying to have a crack at league. Yeah. Um, I think it's exciting. Like, I, 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 we all know I like to talk about a league. Um, I think he'd make a great dummy half. Um, and, and obviously, um, Jake Friend's just retired due to concussion, so it would be a natural fit. Um, is it, Has he played it before? I don't know. Um, has, he, has he got the ability to go in there, learn their system, learn the game that quickly? It's probably easier going from rugby to league than coming from a league heavy background to rugby just because of the rules and the structure. Um, so uh, I, I, think he, I think if anyone could do it, um, he could because one, of his motivation levels and two, just how much of a competitor he is and, and how much he'd, he'd love to probably get an NRL. Um, Trophy. <laughs> Ring. He could start at hooker just distributing, you know, doing a lot of tackling in the middle. But as it goes on, you, you could see more Cam Smith coming out of him, more directing of the play from dummy half, all those kind of things. Oh, absolutely. He'll, he'll definitely be vocal. It's, that's, his, that's in his nature. He'll, 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 want, to, he'll want to be um, you know, a director. And if you think of the injuries that the Roosters have got, you know, they've got no Luke Carey there, who's, who's normally their general. So they've got young... Uh, Sam Walker, who's who's he's about 18 years old. He's, he's quite young in um, stature. They've uh, they've making a makeshift sort of sort of halves combo at the moment. So someone of like a 70 test experience coming in, they probably would want a general. They yeah. would want a vocal nine, someone having that ability to, um, you know, it might be hard. They might it might be hard for them to come in there and, and demand, but they would want someone that has that vocal nature um, and, and demands from each other. So I think it would be a good fit, Bryn. Yeah, I think he I think is, would, might take a little bit of time. But again, he's got his, his player, his style of play, how he plays rugby, I think it's going to transition great into, into the league. I think probably a great position for him to be with being able to transition into it would actually be in 14. Um, it might be a little bit more broken. It won't be so much dependent on him coming on and running the cutter for 80 minutes or 60 minutes and him just being able to I think cover lock, he can cover nine, but then again, he might actually be a, a loser. He's that, he's that competitive and can play that uh, physical. So I think he might have a little, little bit of a hybrid in him, which um, which could be interesting for him moving forward in that for, kind of 14 interchange role. Yeah, well, you can get a little bit of 13 into him as well, kind of playing similar to Jazz Tavanga, maybe. Yeah, like uh, Brandon Smith as well. I just think they've got Nat Butcher there, they've got Sam Verrills coming back. I just don't know if that's the spot they're trying to fill. But is it feasible to bring a guy in mid-season who's never played the sport at a top level? Like, is that is that really rolling the dice a bit oh. much? I think they're probably oh. they're backing themselves coaching-wise. They'll probably be getting to they'd be, I'd say they'd be leaning on um, Sonny Bill a little bit to learn a little bit about his character, how yeah. diligent he would be to um, upskill and learn, um, and how professionally is and, and they'd be relying a little bit on that. If, if a rugby league player was to arrive at your doorstep, you know, halfway through Super Rugby Aotearoa... It's hard. It's, it's, it's a total do, different like, thing, though. Yeah, it Going is, league yeah. to rugby, it's so much harder that way. Because yeah. of the structures yeah, yeah. and, and the breakdown say. is just such a beast that you yeah. need so much more time than, than going from rugby to league. But you spend, I suppose what I'm trying to say is you spend all that time in the pre-season, you do all of those things that build a team together so you understand your structures and your play for someone to arrive that's midway so through de- the season. That's so depleted, though. The Roosters yeah. squad at the moment is so depleted injury-wise. It's not about that. Like, it's like they would... Um, uh, Trent Robinson was on um, the radio the other day saying that, you know, he's, he's at 18 fit players to choose from, 19 wow. fit players to choose from in a squad. I don't think they're going to be worried. They, yeah. they, they, they are depleted. Yeah. You know, you look at Matt Duffy as an example around that. Mm. Um, he was a guy that you know, had played a lot of, you know, growing up playing rugby, went over to the Storm. And he'll be the, he's, you know, I remember talking to him about when his first couple of years he was, he was obviously at Harbour. He said it just took him so long to have the understanding around, you know, what it is to be a, to be a fullback. And obviously, Russell Shepard probably go through the same, the same situation around. There's just so 
when it comes to uh, comes to our game, and whether that be a breakdown or it's a um, it's a pendulum, it's different different plays. You've got to know it's not just like you know not to say that league isn't just it's it's a little bit um, I wouldn't say it's easy to play, but you know there's a lot of block plays and a lot play are very similar. Whereas rugby, there's just so much variety, and you've got to understand so many different things around rules and how you play. So, um, but I think you know you just let's, let's you've got to remember as well. You know TJ is that competitive and you know i look at he actually spoke to brandon smith around you know certain things that he wanted to look for so it's pipeline for a while so he's you know you know knowing tj he's probably you know he's probably talked to the right people who he's needed to talk to is it feasible is this a genuine option of this happening so um i think when you've ever got a guy that's played that many games in rugby uh, at the international level and at the super level and big moments and he's thrived in that, that environment um, again, we're coming back to your point, Chip, around Trent Robinson, around his the back in the coaching style to be able to give him what he needs to succeed at that level if he does go. But don't put it past a guy that will um, that I think will lo- lo- love that challenge. And again, it's in it's in his, it's in his DNA, it's in his blood. There's a lot of royalty with the Piranaras when it comes to rugby league. Mm. One of the things I loved reading uh, rugby league social media over the last week is because you know. The rugby league people in Australia love to hate rugby. Absolutely love it. And they were like, oh, you know, he's never going to handle the middle of the park. You know, he's just yeah, one of these yeah. rugby players. And I thought, you guys have never seen this bloke. Yeah. He, like you said, like the most competitive man in the whole world. Oh. But also just, he loves the physical stuff. Oh, he lives for it. Yeah. He lives for that confrontation. He's going to be in it. He'll, be, he'll, be, he'll do a hit and he'll do the old Kidwell standover. <laughs> he'll give it the old... Alan oh, Gutenberg. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, the old David Kidwell. Um, no, and I think sometimes um, you can get caught up in those stats as well. Like, so sometimes you're the second or third tackler in and you get those stats that are they're quite um, misleading. They don't quite um, show the full picture. And sometimes you know, like we all get celebrated for 15 tackles you know, but you've also hit 30 rucks, so if you add that together, it's 45, you know, and mm. it's, there's so many ways that you could argue it's similar, um, but there's no point because it's, it's never going to be heard. Um, so I, I don't, I, there is a different level of fitness, it's a different fitness. Yeah. So there will be a shift in terms of how you'll have to train and, and get fit for it, but no doubt he'll be making those adjustments already if he's... Uh- if he's doing it. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if RTS is doing similar things right now, making phone calls. Uh, during his 100th game, he looked like it was 100% <laughs> rugby league, like he was all over it. I'm, I'm sure he's done the phone calls before he signed, surely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm sure he's probably... Um, he'd, be, he'd be looking into it because he's, he's got to come back to rugby at some point, so he'll be doing some stuff outside of the rugby league realm mm. uh, of learning what to do, I, I assume. There's no text messages coming through to you? Not to me. Yeah. I'd say it'd be more to Matt Duffy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. It's pretty exciting, though. Like, I know we've got a lot of wingers, we've got a lot of fullbacks, we've got all that stuff, but watching RTS on the weekend, Bryn, watching him do what he does and then thinking, boy, you can be taking on some tight defenders in the last 20 minutes in a rugby game. No one's going to stop you. And also a lot more tired than... Like league forwards are not like um, rugby type five, you know. Like yeah. they, they they are quite a lot fitter mould, if you know what I mean. Like it's a different sort of athlete, so he he, he will be able to mm. cause um, some serious damage late in games. Mm, some props are going to be lurking and left in his dust. <laughs> oh yeah, you wouldn't be want to, you wouldn't want to be on those wide channels. Well, you look. Look at you know, Satoru, you know, a guy with his his kind of footwork, you know, very similar to Rog, who's got a great left foot, actually both both feet actually. So, but I think, um, yeah, anytime, you know, you're probably going to back those coaches around when he does come in. They'll have the plans in place for him to to try and um, upskill himself as quick as he can into the into the season next year. But you yeah, look when he's in in space, depending on playing, playing at fullback or winger, um, you know, you're going to. You're going to look at that, that 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 team sheet and be thinking, "Well, my marking Roger and that left or right will back." So um, it's going to be great for the game when he when he does finally come in uh, next year. It's going to be difficult at the same time, like you say, coming over to this game is is hard. Well, I think you've already heard um, Leon come out and say, "We're not going to rush him." Yeah, it is going to take time, and and that, they've already taken that pressure off him. Yeah. So so I don't he will not be rushed. Um, and whether he starts at fullback or he might even start on the wing and transition to fullback, I don't know. Yeah. They haven't said anything like that to me. I'm just guessing. 
but he came out when mm. it was announced and so said, look, it's, it, is, it will take time. Let's take a look at this week in Sky Super Rugby Aotearoa. We have the Blues versus the Crusaders. Now, take us back a couple of months to March, and this game we were talking, I was one of the people who was guilty of doing this, talking about, hey, the Blues win this, this will be the thing that stops the Crusaders going all the way. They're going to be unstoppable for the rest of the year. Um, now we look at this game, the Blues are a little bit wobbly, the Crusaders aren't doing as well as we think they should, even though they're still seven points ahead on the table. And this game is a completely different look. I think uh, both sides might be keeping under the radar this week. I don't think we'll see anywhere near the level of hype. Yeah, we haven't. Well, we've had um, a day off today, so we probably get in get in the morning. So then I'll be able to uh, give a little bit more to you in the in the, in the later part of the week. <laughs> yeah, I, I do think I think where things are at, um, you know, where the teams were at last time they played, there was a hell of a lot of hype. I, I'm looking from the outside. In, I, I think it's going to be all business in both sides. Yeah. I don't think there'll be too much worried about the hype. I think both sides are going to be focused heavily on themselves and getting themselves right. I think first and foremost, a Blues Crusaders fixtures, it doesn't matter where we are on the table or whatever it is, it, it, it's a big game. So, um, yep, there was probably a, um, a little you bit more hype half your team last time. Didn't you? <laughs> Those changes last weekend, were they more just about rotation and freshness as opposed to anything other than, you know, people saying, oh, geez, is that a respect thing? Are they waiting off no, for the blues? Was, well, uh, what are we talking about? It's here? definitely rotation. Just freshness. rotation. Those boys have played so many minutes. Yeah. Like, they definitely, like, I, I'll even jump in. Like, I know I was trying to wind them up. It <laughs> was definitely, like, and that game went to 90 minutes. And, like, mm. use Sam Whitelock, for example. That guy has played out of his skin and played a number of minutes. Cody Taylor had, coming off the bench, like he's had the season of his life. Like you, you can't just keep putting yeah. them out there. You just can't. Mm. Not in this competition. Well, and that's the hard thing about Super Rugby Aotearoa is that at any point you could be tripped up. And any time you're running that thing where people go, oh, you didn't bring your full team here. Yeah. It's like, well, we can't say that every week. Yeah. No, sorry to jump in there, Bryn, but it's sometimes if you just answer that, it sounds like a PR spin. So I just didn't want... Yeah, because it, 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 it's definitely you have to give guys a rest, a break, mm. um, and they and no no doubt um, I'm sure they, they they would have wanted to play. I know Sam Whitelock certainly wants to play every minute of every game. Yeah, but he yeah. he he'll be fresh and ready to go for the Blues. Unfortunately, this yeah, week. <laughs> you are. Why can the Blues win this? Uh, I, I just think. The, the reason they were unhappy with the Highlands performance is because probably of their own e individual errors and their discipline. So I think if they can just focus on themselves and go back to that simple game plan that, you know, you talk about styles, they know their style because when they did it, when they have that simple game plan and they build phases and pressure and, and execute and, and, you know, have, have you know, utilised their teammates... They can score tries like Rico's try, for instance. It's it, you know it doesn't look they don't make it look hard when they build those phases. It's like there you go. That's how we should do it. So I think they'll, that'll be a big focus. The big focus will be on them, um, which is I think is a great way to go into a Crusaders week rather than building up the big hysteria of Blues Crusaders. I think they'll be primed and just focused on themselves and nailing themselves. And I think that if they can tick off the discipline, can't give the Crusaders any ins, and nailing and executing our own roles, as in the Blues, you know, execute on attack and defence and set piece. Mm. Set piece is big, especially down there, you know, it's huge. If they can get that set piece, execute on attack and defence, win that breakdown, because you've heard here Bryn has stated... The last two weeks, maybe three, we're not happy with our breakdown. We're not happy with our breakdown. We're not happy with our breakdown. So you know mm. there is going to be a backlash at some point. So I would say that the Blues will have heard that. And if not, well, you know that they, they will rectify that and know that it's coming because they lost the breakdown as well, probably against the Highlanders. Um, and I know Dalton, someone like Dalton prides himself in that breakdown. He's a breakdown leader. Um, so he'll be sharpening up that as well. So, you know, that set piece, the breakdown, accuracy, discipline. If they can bring that and look after themselves, I think they can get the result.